Hi everyone, again. Um, so this week um, my lecture mm, tries to bridge um, the... Um, it's a bit looking backward. Uh, <coughs> sorry, what we have <coughs> analyzed over the past couple of weeks, in particular the frameworks of uh, Marxism and semiotics, and to bridge those two frameworks with the one of psychoanalysis through this notion of the other. So quickly, when we analyze Marxism, <clears throat> we have looked at, if we want, the different notions of the other from a Marxist uh, perspective. Uh, for Karl Marx himself, <clears throat> the other is the commodity uh, from which the worker is alienated, is capital uh, that the workers by definition do not own, is factory work in which their um, work is uh, segmented into parcelized and specialized processes. Uh, for Guy Debord, the other, as we've seen, is this immense accumulation of images that he calls the spectacle, which overpowers the individual and separates uh, social life, the flow of social life, uh, uh, in a certain sense, from itself, from its own reproduction. Uh, for Roland Barthes, as we've seen, the other is myth, what he calls myth, uh, if you want even with a capital M, uh, which deprives um, representations, uh, specific um, histories uh, of their particularity and um, attaches these signs to new meanings, to a new system of signification that is transhistorical, transcendental and whose function is to obfuscate the social relations of production. Uh, so we might say that overall in Marxist term, uh, terms, uh, the other is capital, which takes on, depending on the stages of capitalist development, di different forms, and which uh, dominates and reduces the complexity of human beings. Um, semiotics. Semiotics is uh, very important. Roland Barthes is obviously the bridge between Marxism and semiotics, is both a Marxist and a semiotician, but before Barthes, we have uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, for uh, whom language the, understood as a, um, as a whole is other um, uh, in that the individual cannot really control uh, the rules and the evolution of language. You are always born into uh, language and we have to learn its conventions and we can only master language as we speak it but never as a whole. Um, at the same time for the Sassure meaning is not determined by the inherent properties of a sign but by the difference among signs and the play of the signs within a linguistic structure that determines their meaning. So um, such difference is determined, as we've seen, like phonetically, for example, right, as uh, the new words that emerge cannot resemble existing words, but um, it can also be determined through a play of binary um, oppositions. We might think about how black can be understood only in relation to white, male to female, uh, native to immigrant. Hence, um, from a, a Sassurian perspective, the other can be seen as a foundational split in signification as ultimately there is no meaning without uh, the other. Uh, we might add that somebody like Stuart Hall, who is also a Marxist, um, um, founder of cultural studies and who uses semiotics, in this couples, white, black, male, female, native, immigrant, the first term of the couple, white, male, and native in this case, is always stronger than the second term, so it's in a relation of power. So building on this, I just want to ask you a question. Look at this image. This is um, a Pirelli ad from the 1980s, I believe, and this is uh, the well-known athlete uh, black athlete Carl Lewis. So using a semiotic approach, using, for example, notions of denotation, connotation, signifier, signified, and precisely this uh, play of binary. Binaries uh, um, look at how uh, this ad mobilizes binary oppositions. Um, I'm now moving to psychoanalysis, which was precisely the theme of uh, this week. And as we have seen in the first reading, uh, the Mansfield on Freud, uh, for Freud the other is essential to cons the constitution of the subject and, and of, uh, in particular of sexual identity, which is uh, foundational for uh, Freud to uh, 
subjectivity. So um, he, he looks at the uh, in sex terms for him the boy uh, initially desires his mother but because his desire is barred from sexual desire is barred from the presence of the father uh, the boy can uh, only identify with his father when he realizes that his mother was punished by castration. Um, there is the famous um, Oedipus Rex um, uh, tragedy from which Freud derives the Oedipus complex and Oedipus becomes a king, becomes Rex only by after killing accidentally his father. Uh, by contrast, the girl initially identifies uh, with the father, but when she realizes that she cannot be him, she unconsciously tries to win him over by burying this child, and in this way she becomes mother. Uh, this um, uh, Freudian reading of sexual identity has been uh, highly criticized by women and feminist uh, theorists uh, um, for being inherently sexist and putting uh, the male and the penis always in a position of power. However, I want you to be aware um, of it because uh, the second um, analyst we are considering, psychoanalyst we are considering this, w uh, this week is obviously uh, highly indebted um, to Freud. Uh, Jacques Lacan uh, developed um, this important theory of the mirror stage when he argues that uh, toddlers acquire a sense of self, we acquire basically a sense of who we are at the moment in which we recognize ourselves to be a, an individual in the mirror. And so this mirror, um, uh, Freud, uh, Lacan describes it as a moment in which almost like the pores of our skin suture, right? The body of the toddler is, is a scattered body. The body, the, 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 the toddler doesn't know to be one until he or she begins to master his body. And, um, and so, the imaginary, this sense of imaginary wholeness, right, uh, is projected onto what is otherwise a fragmentary experience of the real and of the body. And identification through uh, the mirror stage is thus a fundamentally narcissistic experience, which remains, however, partial and incomplete because a mirror is just a mirror. Is, uh, not, there is nobody else there besides yourself. To validate your own image. So Lacan says that because narcissistic identification is incomplete, we always um, try to fill it in through our imagination. And this imagination is a fantasy construction, a self-gratifying um, mechanism through which uh, we see ourselves as perfect, as always returning to that original moment, originary moment. Uh, of perfection in which we recognize ourselves as uh, one. And so this ideal ego, this uh, narcissism, continues to accompany the individual throughout his or her life. That means that we all have a certain dose of narcissism uh, built into us, right? And it sets in motion always a desire, there is this drive to return to the original perfection of the mirror. Stage. This also means that desire points to a fundamental lack in the structure of the subject that we try to appease through temporary gratifications and um, um, contemporary capitalism is perfect in providing us with all these um, temporary gratifications that uh, we find through uh, consumption, uh, sexual satisfaction, careerism, that however um, always leave us um, unsatis ultimately unsatisfied. So my uh, question here is like, well, like, let's begin to think about this notion of the um, ideal ego, of imaginary identification through the images that are circulated uh, in the media, right? This is a well-known boy band, the Wine Directions. And let's think about how the media build these images that really cater to a teenage population that is struggling to build uh, his or like teenagers are constantly struggling to build their own sense of selves, right? So the, the one direction, this image in a certain sense tells you uh, that you could be, right, one of these uh, uh, stars, right? 
Um, by contrast, uh, there is a, another concept that um, Lacan contrasts to the one that, of the ideal ego, and it's the one of the ego ideals, which pertains to how the subject sees himself from an ideal point of view, so not in the mirror, um, but from an ideal point of view, which Lacan calls the other, with a capital um, O, that is external to uh, the subject. And symbolic identifications pertains to how the big other sees us, propelling us constantly to give our best. Right? You might think about a teacher, for example, uh, in any field, uh, not just me, who tells you something about your performance that uh, prompts you to uh, wanting you to, to do better. Right? Uh, perhaps because you want to become uh, like your teacher in that field. Right? And um, uh, Lacan says that um, the symbolic order, right, is the space that coincides uh, with the law, the, what he calls the master signifier, the name of the father, and um, is this realm that sets these uh, restrictions, right, that uh, control our desire, that therefore cannot flow uh, without restrictions, and, and regulate also society, regulate communication, for example, uh, among individuals. You would like to say uh, at certain moments uh, a bad word uh, to somebody, but you, 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 you hold yourself, right? You keep uh, yourself because you know that uh, there is something out there that um, has taught you that those feelings cannot be directly expressed. Uh, so my final questions are about how we have seen perhaps how imaginary identification might work in and through the media, but how does symbolic identification, the ego ideal work, circulates uh, in the media? Do the media appeal? This is part of the same question, only to our imagination to gratify our fantasies, or do they also prompt us to give our best? So, based on these questions, just make examples, answer these questions by making examples of how media shape your own sense of self, both in the sense of the imaginary uh, ideal ego and symbolic identification ego ideal. Thank you very much.